Apparently, a lot of people wondered how I got to keep my hair and be 230 pounds with 14% body fat and um, be relatively healthy while I did it. So I guess we'll tell you a lot of the secrets when we dig into this podcast, but um, there isn't really a particular secret that you can you know, do one thing and have all of these results. Um, and by these results, I mean have um, supposedly such good DEXA scan numbers and then still look like I have tiny arms. So listen more for some tips regarding that. Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today we're doing a follow-up Q&A uh, I guess relating to two videos. So mm -hmm. first for our personal hair loss protocols, and then yep. number two for our personal anabolic protocols. Yeah, so uh, we really appreciate all the questions. There are several good questions, um, and we'll just kind of go through them line by line and do our best to answer. And we'll try to include timestamps as well. So you can skip around if there's just specific ones that you're interested in. Yeah, so starting off, hey, Dr. Gillette, great episode. For maintaining fertility, do you recommend taking HCG from the beginning of TRT or waiting the six to eight week phase to confirm via labs how one responds to something like testosterone alone? Yeah, generally you don't wanna start them at the exact same time. Usually it takes a few months depending on the individual to start noticing testicular atrophy or if you're in the case like me, if you already have testicular atrophy before um, anything, a lot of times you actually start with HCG, which is uh, what I did a couple of years ago, and then rehypertrophy the testes, and then consider other options from there. So uh, I guess like anything else um, that you would chat with with a specialist, the right answer is always, it depends. If you start testosterone and HCG at the same time, there is kind of a synergistic effect when it comes to acne. So that is a very common side effect. Um, so yeah, in general, you'd wanna wait the six to eight week phase, and not everybody needs to be on HCG all the time. As I mentioned in um, the podcast kind of leading up to this, most of the time I'm either on just HCG or just test sip. So it, um, it depends. Hopefully that helps. Although a lot of people do testosterone and HCG at the same time. Yeah. And context is always, it depends. So if someone is planning for fertility within the next year, um, you may be in a position where it's best to hold off on beginning testosterone in the first place. Yep. So Lots to talk about with your clinician there. Yeah, and get a sperm test before too. And bank your sperm as well, because why not? Yeah, yep. can't hurt. Yep. Um, next question. What was your, and I'm not sure if they're talking about the, me or you, we could both answer it, I guess. Yeah. What was your optimized calculated free testosterone? Great question, because that is more accurate than, um, than the measured. Um, Prior to starting replacement therapy, so actually prior to starting HCG, um, my optimized calculated free T, you know, I'm doing um, all the lifestyle management and taking my testosterone vitamin, because there's no such thing as a testosterone booster. I was taking my <laughs> testosterone vitamin. Um, I think it was something like four capsules of, I don't even know if we had Sigma back then. Anyway, it was something similar. And I think it was around five nanograms per deciliter. But my calculated free DHT, I wish I had checked a free DHT, I checked a free estradiol, um, was probably something like six or seven. Um, and I think it was still pretty high even on finasteride, because I was on finasteride before I was on HCG. Uh, I think finasteride was the first medication that I took. For boosting your T. Or maybe it was tea. a Zetamib. Actually, finasteride probably did boost your T slightly. Yeah, if I was not on finasteride, my free T may have been... Uh, or I think I got it up to seven, it may have been five if I was not on finasteride. Yeah, and I, yeah. I guess you? my optimized, I guess my peak free testosterone, assuming a couple of things here. So if we go back over a decade, this makes me feel like I'm old. <laughs> you are uh, like 50 or 60, I think. I act like it. <laughs> <laughs> but if I go back to high school, I actually had some testosterone levels checked because I had broken a lot of bones growing up. And there was a question about bone density being an issue. Um, Smart and guy. my, so, well, it was partially myself, then partially the doctor agreeing to check it. So a lot of places you would just be told, no, we're not going to check that. Um, but 
I guess this is going back. There's a little bit of rapport between myself and my primary care provider. Wow. It was a younger guy that a was young kind male, of that... known in the community yeah. and agreed to check a total testosterone level. Um, no SHBG, no free T. Um, I don't think I had gonadotropins because there wasn't really a, a need to do that. It was just kind of starting with, hey, what's the testosterone? Uh, and that level came back at 420 something. And assuming my SHBG has been similar, that probably puts my free testosterone between 10 and 11 nanograms per deciliter. So nothing necessarily wrong with that testosterone level. Prior to starting replacement therapy, my free testosterone level would have been closer to between 5 and 6 nanogram per deciliter. My total was between 230 and 250, two separate times. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this was the caveat while I was working night shift. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those was a morning reading after a you know, night sleep where I was actually sleeping at night on a day off. The other was a afternoon reading shortly after awakening on a night that I was going to be working. So I kind of checked both. At that time, I didn't know that the diurnal pulse was still mm -hmm. preserved. But in any case, I, yep. by happenstance, got both readings. So assuming my SHBG was between 20 and 30, uh, like it normally sits, that would put my free T between five and six. Yeah, and perhaps you did. I mean, in hindsight, that seems like a pretty good call. But you haven't had any broken bone since. Um, but yeah, I guess you could also make the argument, well, you should have quit your job, stopped working night shifts, stopped <laughs> going to nursing school, stopped studying so hard late at night. And instead you should have like, um, you know, uh, went and done three hours of meditation and mindfulness for, you know, dopaminergic tone and improved your sleep. Um, you yeah, know, why didn't and you do, and bought a sauna and sun a my testicles and, daily and, and yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So why didn't yeah. you do that? There are trade-offs. And, uh, yeah, the time you know, being younger and, and focusing on working hours and income and advancing education, sort of having competing priorities, it seemed like the least bad option. Um you know, as it relates, there's a lot of alternative things you can do for energy, and we can talk about those when I think someone asked about the yep. TRT story. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll really expand upon that a bit later. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. And before we do that, I will say similar story with myself. What really did it for me, at least when I started the HDG at the start, is when I not only was delivering babies and um, not sleeping well, and also trying to naturally optimize testosterone. I was also training quite hard, um, trying to get back into shape. And I also had two children under the age of 18 months. I had a newborn and an 18 month old. So as you can imagine, as an involved father, I was not sleeping a lot between all those things. Yeah, pretty suboptimal for testosterone production. Yep. Next is, I've heard you mention a few times about L-carnitine raising TMAO. Um, it basically, it means, yes, you have gut microbiome dysbiosis, choline and carnitine are converted to TMAO in, um, states of dysbiosis. Uh, this happened to this individual, it went up to over 60 and they've always had bloating issues. Uh, they've been taking the seed probiotic, seed probiotics, a probiotic that has, I believe all the same strains as VSL number three, which is visbiome plus a few extra. Um, they also have good fiber intake five to six servings fruit and vegetables. What else are they doing? Um, so they are doing quite a bit. Yeah, and the point about the L-carnitine raising TMAO, uh, there's an interesting study that I shared about plant-based diets versus uh, omnivorous diets and raising the TMAO. And it doesn't actually turn out to always be the case. Uh, I recently had a patient who was on a vegetarian diet and wanted to check TMAO levels. So we did, because they were supplementing with L-carnitine. Mm -hmm. And they actually had elevated TMAO. So that doesn't seem to be a hard and fast rule. Um, how big of a player is TMAO in the overall cardiovascular disease risk spectrum? Probably, probably a relatively small one. Yep. But if you can make some changes, um, uh, one thing I, this person didn't mention is perhaps supplementing with a, a berberine or some optimized yep. garlic, garlic with allicin. Yep. Those are some things that have preclinical data that supports this change. Yep. Now, there are differences in rodents and humans, obviously, uh, but anecdotally, this does seem to push down TMAO levels mm -hmm. uh, or perhaps switching to a injectable form to bypass the GI tract altogether. Yeah. Any other thoughts there? Yeah, probably until TMAO is under a bit better control because 60 plus is pretty high. Decreasing the amount uh, 
to some degree of L-carnitine or choline precursors. And that could include alpha GPC, that can include phosphatidylserine, which is in a lot of like calming supplements. Um, some multivitamins even have choline bitartrate, for example. So there's a lot of things that could be driving this up. Yeah. Um, carnivore diets, which this person's not yeah, on. I would say congratulations to this person for having a good fiber intake and yes. getting five to six servings of fruits and vegetables per day. The, that puts them in the like 1% of the population. Yes, the things that this individual is doing to address the TMAO is going to have far better effects on health. Even if it does not budge the TMAO at all, yeah. uh, the health is still significantly better for it than if they were just taking a supplement for it. Absolutely. Um, next, someone asked about, uh, curious about total testosterone. They also have varicocele, about the same age as me, um, and low end of normal range free, so low normal free testosterone and total testosterone. So yeah, a lot of times with varicocele, and this was certainly the case in my case as well, although I did eat relatively low carb and did a lot of cardio, your SHBG runs on the higher end of normal. So it, it's more common to see a lower normal or a low free testosterone and a normal total testosterone, almost like andropause or uh, honestly kind of similar to people that have an orchiectomy or undescended testicle, um, testicle loss for whatever reason, traumatic loss, usually high SHBG, high FSH, low free T. And um, in general, you can estimate the severity or the grade of your varicocele based upon those markers. Uh, you're more likely to have a high grade or uh, more atrophy with higher FSH, higher SHBG, and lower free T. Next, um, they're asking, presumably both of us, um, are we doing subcutaneous? And um, would love to know your hematocrit, hemoglobin, and estradiol levels, um, which I think you, in our previous podcast, you just posted some of those levels. Yeah, so uh, subcutaneous, uh, yes. Uh, it seems like the sort of best way to go about it is scar tissue in the muscle, potentially more stable blood levels. Um, as far as the hematocrit hemoglobin, uh, personally, I've never had these levels high or even on the high end of the range. Mm. They tend to be about mid-range, which uh, would be expected in my case. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, estradiol levels tend to be um, just shy of a one to two conversion with my free testosterone. So. Yep. Assuming my free testosterone is something like 18, I would expect my estradiol level to be between 30 and 35. Um, and that's a sensitive assay. The Rochaclea assay is going to push that number up a bit more. Yep. Yeah, so if I check a sensitive estradiol, usually somewhere between 35 and 40. Although if my free testosterone is something like 20, gets up to 25 nanograms per deciliter, then yeah, my I would expect my estradiol to get up to 50, but honestly it doesn't. Even on dutasteride and finasteride and HCG, my estradiol just does not run high. Yeah, I will say I do tend to get a fair bit more aromatization versus testosterone production from something like an HCG. So I may only see a, you know, 80 nanogram per deciliter output in testosterone or adding that to my TRT. Whereas the estradiol increase there could be something like 10, 15, 20 picograms per ml. Yeah. Um, why are we calling dutasteride anabolic? It blocks conversion to DHT. Great question. Yeah, maybe we can splice up the, uh, were they, I think, siblings or identical? No, not identical twins, but perhaps twins that uh, Derek had a conversation with someone about yeah. showing the two that had the 5-alpha reductase deficiency, mm -hmm. had uh, no hairline recession and more muscle mass. Testosterone is arguably more anabolic than DHT, but much less androgenic. So dutasteride is for sure an anti-androgenic compound, mm -hmm. but it is arguably mildly pro-anabolic. That's a great question. This individual, I, I think it commented on two separate videos with the same Th question. Thank you for supporting the uh, us via the algorithm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How we appreciate it. Um, next question regarding the Urology Times Journal. Real world, world data for patients treated with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors showed sexual adverse effects occurred at higher rates in patients receiving finasteride compared with dutasteride. Um, and that's probably taking into account the patients on dutasteride were on daily dutasteride, which is much, much, much stronger. 
than finasteride. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you'd probably have to take 40 megs daily finasteride to be uh, anywhere close. Um, I'm partly just saying that because I think there is a study where someone took 40 meg dose yeah, of finasteride. A loading dose. Yep. Actually, no, 400 finasteride. Oh, wow. 40 was the loading dose of dutasteride now that I think about it. It's like a, a three year commitment to dutasteride. <laughs> Anyways, um, according to the study in the European Association of Urology, the risk of ejaculation disorders was eight times higher with finasteride than dutasteride. Risk of ED and decreased libido was five times higher. Clinicians should consider these data when prescribing 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, said Antonio Franco um, from Department of Urology in Rome. Um, very interesting comment. Um, we've talked about kind of like the, the theoretical benefits of dutasteride for many hours in this podcast, but um, this, I, I guess, should not be particularly surprising. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And I, I think I've seen this one, um, yeah, 2021. Mm -hmm. And it, it's mixed. Some will say that there's a similar rate of adverse events. Uh, some will say like this one, that it seems to be a lower risk of adverse events, specifically sexual function with dutasteride. Um, and I think that um, with, there's an article specifically discussing post finasteride syndrome yep. um, and that this has not been documented in dutasteride. Um, not to say that someone can't have signs of androgen deprivation from dutasteride, but it seems less common. And of course there's differences in the number of prescriptions that are written also. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see in the future as more meta analyses come out um, that kind of pull all these data together. What would a constantly high sex hormone binding globulin above 50 nanomol per liter and LH above eight IU per liter, uh, technically not high, but high normal. I, I get the point they're making there. Uh, what would these indicate despite normal testosterone levels, you know, 650 to 800 FSH also on the low side, you know, two to three. And, mm -hmm. and lots of times this is totally normal yep. you know, FSH. They've heard about testicular dysfunction and subclinical hypogonadism. Hmm. Would love to know your thoughts. Subclinical hypogonadism. Reminds me of subclinical hypothyroidism, which is we it now call the euthyroid yeah. syndrome. Is this a ICD-10 at this point in time? Uh, it is not. Euthyroid six syndrome is though. Um, but yeah, as far as this, um, uh, then my takeaway is LH receptor desensitivity, relative testicular dysfunction, eugenadal testicular dysfunction, um, and in general, latex cell dysfunction to some degree. Yeah. So those are the moving parts there. Um, their free testosterone levels are probably on the lower end of normal, um, mm -hmm. if not in a hypogonadal range, depending on how much above 50 the SHBG is. Um, so, you know, things to increase the sensitivity to LH could make sense. Um, avoiding things that cause latex cell dysfunction, like yep. chronic NSAID use, like even yep. ibuprofen. Iron uh, overload. Yeah, could cause some of these things. Yep. Uh, next question. My testosterone on dutasteride and 175 milligram per week TRT was 1800. So total testosterone. That sounds like some compounded testosterone. Yeah, it, it could have just a certain compounding. It could have just been from certain compounding pharmacies that tend to be uh, overdosed. I was going to say um, generously dosed, but generously dosed is actually just never mind. Um, so moving on, <laughs> they're on 120 milligrams now because of how how high the testosterone was. I'd be interested if they switched which compounding pharmacy or which uh, carrier oil or whatnot the testosterone was. Mm -hmm. was um, have not gotten updated blood work yet. Estradiol was 36 nanograms per, de uh, 36 nanograms per deciliter, probably well, picograms per mil. Maybe that's the conversion. Is nanogram per deciliter the same as picogram per mL? Anyway, nope. well, let's it's assume a, it's the standard factor of 10, factor of 10 different. Um, anyway, uh, the sensitive assay, estradiol was 36, probably picogram per mil. So uh, I guess the question is, is this normal? Yes, it's normal. Um, dutasteride, especially if this person's on quite a bit of dutasteride, um, 175 milligrams of uh, testosterone cypionate or an anthate per week um, will lead to, uh, you know, probably 20% higher testosterone levels. It's not too surprising. Yeah, and also sort of thinking, what is their protocol? Are they injecting this all once per week? Uh, certainly a peak of 1800 wouldn't be surprising there, but if it is split up, yep. 
Or if you're checking a level, let's say 24 hours after one of your three weekly shots, something like that, if you do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, then that would be quite a bit higher than expected. But going down on the dose obviously makes sense here. Yep, uh, so it's a good question. Um, and also in general, if your uh, total testosterone level on dutasteride um, is, you know, say like 1200, 1300, that would be roughly equal to a, like, let's say your DHT is cut in half from 60 to 30 or 60 to 20 on finasteride or dutasteride. I would say uh, 1200, 1300 total testosterone is still technically eugenatal physiologic range. You could even make an argument that 1200 or 1300, like, you know, there's plenty of people with naturally um, produced testosterone levels that high. Yeah, it certainly can be a natural level, uh, although relatively uncommon. No, probably not if your SHBG is 7. So, so oh. speaking of endogenous T levels, someone asks, how high are both of your endogenous T levels? And um, just like we talked about, uh, total range for myself has been somewhere between 230 and 420-something. Um, free testosterone between 5 and 11 nanogram per deciliter. Yeah, and roughly the same for me. Um, probably a little bit lower free testosterone just because my SHBG runs quite high. And um, anytime you're talking about endogenous T levels, include what your SHBG is and include your DHT. DHT and SHBG both often over 60. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, what does Kyle mean about being in a traffic jam wishing he was on Butastride? This is because you were pulling your hair out in traffic, right? Yeah, so I think I even typed up a, a pretty long response to this question on the last video via the Gillette Health account. But um, when you're on dutasteride, a lot of times you are less patient. So yeah, you, you kind of want to pull out your hair. Um, dutasteride, uh, of course, um, affects the amount of DHT that's binding in the prefrontal cortex. Um, now, androgens don't necessarily cause aggression or rage. It can augment that effect. But as anybody will tell you, you know, generally, I'm walking around like I'm uh, taking uh, a daily Xanax and a daily cannabinoid, <laughs> which is certainly not the case. Um, I've been tested many times and I do not take those things. But, um, and no judgment to those that do, by the way. It's like, let's not get it off on a rabbit trail here. But um, yeah, dutaster when I'm on dutasteride, it feels like there's slightly more patience. And patience is a virtue. Yeah. So again, total androgen pool. Um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, you put your tinfoil hat on and you think about the uh, natural personality traits of every male and female. And if you're thinking about things like oral contraceptives or metabolic syndrome, which are causing lower total androgen pools, and also often more fluctuations, spikes and crash in, is in androgens, it's not necessarily a good thing for society. Yeah, that's a very deep and from a philosophical, philosophical standpoint, that would be a fun conversation. You want your calmest, kindest, um, most patient individuals to have high total androgen pools, and you want your most aggressive, meanest, uh, immoral individuals to have low total androgen pools. There is a reason why we chemically castrate um, certain individuals that are guilty of horrible crimes. So like a social credit score that shows you how high or how low your testosterone level can be. If your social credit score is high, then you get uh, 140 milligrams per week. If it's low, you get 20 milligrams per week. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm getting 20 milligrams per week. This is great. Uh, but really, it, it's just... Uh, inhibiting natural production. Yeah. But anyway, I guess, speaking of tinfoil hats, <laughs> uh, creatine and hair loss scares me is our next comment. Uh, really not a reason to be scared of creatine as it relates to hair loss. I, I'd never say never that it couldn't possibly ever cause hair loss in somebody because um, sometimes introducing new compounds into the body, your body can react. It could have a transient shedding phase, but it's certainly not going to overpower your finasteride or dutasteride, and it's probably not the major player in hair loss. Yeah. Um, next question, James, are you available for individualized medicine in California? Yes, I am licensed in California. 
Um, it did take a long time because the California Board of Nursing is uh, about as efficient as you would expect. Um, they're listening. <laughs> and if they're listening, um, I would appreciate improvement in customer service. And that's all I'll say. Yeah, uh, we do have a location opening up in Newport Beach here in a bit. Um, my favorite canned sardine. Uh, my absolute favorite is Fishwife. I like their chili crisp. Um, but that is a kind of prohibitively expensive for me to enjoy too often. Usually I'm eating the, I think the Wild Planet from Costco. Yeah, I'll pick anything that's canned in oil just because it makes it more palatable, more enjoyable compared yeah. to being in water. For sure. Would creatine help post-op rotator cuff surgery? I would say yes. I would say that your ability to exercise, whether it's physical therapy, um, hopefully not CrossFit if you're post-rotator cuff surgery right away anyway. Not going to hurt. Uh, yeah. But it's certainly going to improve your recovery from those PT sessions and your ability to go mm -hmm. back and do more of those PT-specific mm -hmm. prescribed exercises. Yep. Um, going to help more if you have a low-protein diet. Uh, there's some supplements like Juven, which is kind of an amino acid vitamin blend that is particularly helpful in people with poor diets. Um, guys, fantastic video. James, hope you don't mind. What is your motivation? So you kind of talked about this already, but what is your motivation for starting TRT? Um, you're young, although you look old. They didn't say that. <laughs> you're young, probably had normal testosterone levels. Uh, did you mainly aim for higher mental and physical energy or do you expect longevity benefits? There are downsides. So taking such a step early in life requires higher conviction. Um, although they didn't say this either, arguably slightly less conviction if you have like a comfortable knowledge base about it. Um, you guys are too smart to just be gym bros. Well, thank you. Uh, so what's your reason? Yeah, so here is, uh, I'm titled this James's TRT story. Um, so like I talked about, I was you know working night shift and had checked some blood levels and they were low. And, you know, 230, 250 nanogram per deciliter, somewhere in that range. And uh, what I did, and by the way, I don't rec recommend this, but in the you know, concept of transparency, I did testosterone as a test drive prior to getting a prescription for it to say, is this going to work, have the benefits that I'm looking for? Not the smartest thing to do, but when you are, you know, not blessed with a lot of resources at the time and trying to make things work and figure out, is this going to be a good investment? That was a choice that I chose to make. Uh, but then you know, after I realized, you know, hey, I am getting you know, some benefits in terms of you know, exercise recovery, there was certainly a component of that, uh, but also just energy levels in general and motivation. Um, I can't say that there was any difference in cognitive or mental function, uh, although some people do report that. It's mm -hmm. not something that I would say more than a quarter of people are you know, specifically saying, hey, this got better after TRT. Mm -hmm. Certainly wasn't my case. Um, so that's sort of my motivation behind it. So it's not 100% gym bro, not 100% for like mental performance, sort of looking at all of the potential benefits of it and then having an understanding about kind of how testosterone worked. You know, going back all the way to high school, I'd had levels checked at some point. Uh, I've been reading about stuff since then, was in mm -hmm. the medical field. So made it a little bit lower risk because I realized, hey, you know, this isn't permanent. You know, people don't, just because you go on some testosterone doesn't mean you're on it forever. Um, and certainly I have considered like, well, now that I have a little bit more of an optimized lifestyle and sleep patterns, what would my natural levels be? Mm -hmm. But I also have the knowledge of my sensitivity to androgens with my CAG repeat length of 28. That actually puts me closer to Kennedy's disease than it does to the average repeat length for a Caucasian male. So being more on the androgen insensitive side, um, I don't see myself probably coming off of testosterone and, and even having a fall of my levels into like a low normal range. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't have proof that that would be harmful for me in the long term, but I like the idea of being able to recover from exercise, keep my lean body mass, improve my bone density, um, and then maintain a good degree of androgen signaling, mm -hmm. um, also in the context of the other goal of keeping my hair. Yeah. So I suppose that's a bit of a background there. It's a good example of individualized medicine where the patient's goals is one of the things to keep in account. Um, you know, it's not a cookie cutter thing where everybody under the ages of 30 gets a serum and everybody over the ages of 30 gets um, what, you know, whatever 
testosterone regimen you happen to make the most money or get the most lunches for prescribing. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good anecdote. Next question, great podcast, curious, uh, uh, regarding both of our regimens, have our dutasteride or finasteride protocols involved topical applications? Do we take tablets? Uh, any concerns for finasteride syndrome? So historically, I have used topical dutasteride. It was sort of a blend of dutasteride and minoxidil and some tretinoin. Um, I didn't find it to be particularly effective. I do have a little bit more aggressive androgenic alopecia. Uh, my serum DHT level was 69 when I was taking that. So it was within the normal realm of conversion between at five and 10%. So it, in my case, I don't believe it was going systemic, but in some people we do see evidence of that. Um, and now my regimen is um, entirely oral in terms of the dutasteride and the finasteride, both of which I take orally. Yeah, uh, and as I've mentioned uh, with my regimen, I have not taken topicals. Um, not that I'm against topicals, but um, you know, it, just the convenience of taking a tablet is fantastic. And on paper, I'm kind of a, a great candidate for dutasteride and finasteride. You know, very low estrogen, high progestogen pool, high strong androgens, high DHT, um, low anxiousness, OCD type predispositions, um, naturally pretty high libido. Um, so in fact, I was kind of hoping that in the pelvic rest period after having um, my second kid that it would kind of help if I increase the dose. That's when I tried daily finasteride, daily dutasteride, and three times a day salt palmetto. Um, and, and yeah, I really didn't see huge effects, huge beneficial effects of decreasing that during that period of time. Um, but yeah, partly just because I knew I was a great candidate on paper. Um, so that's what I did. Yeah, currently I take uh, dutasteride, only comes in 0.5 mg capsules, don't recommend the compounded. I take that uh, orally twice a week. Yeah, it's a great overview. Uh, another one says, I guess this is in relation to things that are anabolic. Does tricasterone or ectosteroids compete or counter using Tomcat and Fidoja at the same time? Could all three be utilized at once or do their mechanisms of action counter one another to some degree? This is a, a thoughtful question because you certainly yes. wouldn't want to be, you know, first acknowledging that supplements have interactions potentially is a great step mm -hmm. and you wouldn't want to be countering benefits of something with something else. Yeah. So instead of just saying, you know, these thing, ectosteroids or Tonkat or Fidoja is trash or it's amazing, everyone should take it. Um, you should realize that supplements have pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics too. What is the mechanism of action? What is the effect on the body? And I would say these do potentially interact, not significantly, and the mechanisms of action do not interact. But given that tricesterone and beta ectosterone, the two main ectosteroids, uh, well, first of all, if they're not bioavailable, then they're not going to be binding the beta estradiol receptor. So, so then they, they don't be have pharmacokinetics if Correct. they're not bioavailable. They still do, but you would have to inject them, uh, which I don't recommend <laughs> doing that. Don't even think about that. Forget about that. The That I know of the only complex, so complex uh, uh, makes these things easier to absorb. Um, ectosteroids that I know of are the gorillamine slash intelligent ectosteroids. So, um, but yeah, in general, these are really only applicable for people that have rock bottom estradiols. Mostly postmenopausal females with low estradiol. So lean, low, low body fat postmenopausal females or females with breast cancer on aromatase inhibitors that have extremely low estrogen. Um, past that, perhaps if there's like a really lean male that has a sensitive estradiol less than like two or three so like, thinking of uh, like a marathon or an endurance athlete, that sort yes. of phenotype. Yeah. Or perhaps like a Olympic weightlifter or a power lifter that, um, you know, is either a postmenopausal female or a male that has relatively low free testosterone. They're cutting down to make a weight class and uh, they check a sensitive estradiol and it's like less than 2.5. Then, yeah, they probably get some fluid retention and perhaps some anabolic benefit from those. Um, Tonkat Vidoja, we've done many podcasts on, um, and yeah, they have niche applications for natural optimization where the, uh, benefit outweighs the potential risk. 
But in general, I can't see any scenario where you'd want to utilize all three. Yeah, if you're using, let's, let's put this directionally, if you're using Tomcat at the Doge, the estradiol itself that goes up is probably going to be uh, a more potent lever than using the you know, beta ectosterone or trichesterone, even if it's complex. Yep. Thoughts on compounded test screen, or presumably uh, androgel test gel as well. Uh, it seems that ester-free testosterone has benefits, uh, less suppression potentially, um, and DHT benefits. Benefits of DHT. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose if there's a reason why you're trying to dose really low, but then still, honestly, I think there's more of a DHT detriment because the 5-alpha reduction and conversion of testosterone to DHT you get via transdermal application, whether it is the patch, the cream, or gel, is supraphysiologic. So you do see more erythrocytosis and theoretically more blood clots. Um, and more left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so yeah, I would say that's one of the reasons why we don't prefer compounded test cream. Um, in general, if people have significant needle phobia, better options are Natesto, which is nasal testosterone, and lymphatically absorbed testosterone, like mm -hmm. Jotenzo. Yeah, an oral lymphatically absorbed testosterone would make a lot more sense in this scenario from a risk benefit standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, although there can be sort of a niche scenario where test cream is used intermittently for an acute um, sort of libido boost if somebody does seem to benefit a little bit from a hormone fluctuation. Generally, we would think more stability is better, um, but some people probably need a little bit of up and down sort of to mimic the diurnal pattern. So, you know, using test cream once per week maybe to help libido would be sort of the one-off scenario where I could think, okay, that might make sense in some people. Yep. Next question. Uh, this person would love to hear our thoughts on varicoceles. If 30% of men have some grade of varicocele, um, yet almost nobody talks about it. That's true. Um, yeah, I'll, you know, most of this 30% is individuals who have relatively low grade. That's not likely to affect their, um, I guess, chance at fertility, but it does affect their sperm count and it is likely to affect their testosterone to some degree. Um, and it can make them more prone to things um, like heat damage to the testicle. Yeah, and you and I have talked a bit about this in like a varicocele repair or varicocelectomy. Mm -hmm. And there is data supporting like, hey, if you get your varicocele repaired, that you get some improvement in testosterone, 100, 200, maybe yeah. 300 nanogram per deciliter, depending. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be a durable effect, um, but in the short term, it does improve that. Uh, if there's significant testicular pain, there can be a reason to do so. Yep. I think the reason less people talk about it is because there's not a reimbursement model where a urologist will perform this procedure and get reimbursed just because you want to take your testosterone level from 500 to 800 nanogram per deciliter. So yes, the varicocele is there. It's lowering the testosterone. It's lowering sperm count, but it's not what they would call clinically significant. So I think that's the reason that it's not more talked about. Yeah. I remember going to a urologist even within the past couple of years, and I've since found a urologist who actually we should have on the podcast, um, um, who's fantastic. But I remember going to one and saying, you know, um, I've had some things done, but I'm having a lot of testicular pain, you know, uh, on HCG, which I do for hypertrophy. My varicocele pain's worse. My hemorrhoids are worse. My acne's worse. Um, what about getting this ligated versus embolized? which uh, generally an IR would embolize it. A urologist would ligate it, but it's much more expensive to embolize. And um, basically the only thing that was said was, well, are you infertile? Do you have kids? I was like, well, I have a couple kids. Um, not infertile, but I also know, you know, ways to Im improve my fertility. Um, and they were like, well, uh, you know, why, why would you want to do that? And I was like, is, is this person serious? Like, do they know the association about testosterone and, you know, earlier testicular failure, earlier andropause, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even more hemosiderin deposits because you have more venous stasis. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, most people just don't know this. So we will dedicate an entire podcast to this. And now that I think of it, I will ask that uh, top-notch urologist to come on. Yeah, I think that'd be great info. So no one is talking about it, then why not us? Let's talk about it. 
Next, does L-carnitine overall negatively impact hair loss? It increases androgen receptor density, but it also helps shuttle fatty acids into mitochondria, which decreases apoptosis in follicular cells, question mark? Great question. Yeah. Uh, and they answer the question too. So we, we agree, um, likely a net neutral. Yeah, we don't know. And again, we would think it probably would increase AR content in the skin as well, scalp skin, but I don't think we have any data to point to. But I don't think that there's been a market association of people taking L-carnitine supplements or injecting L-carnitine and having hair loss follow. So it probably is a net neutral, which theoretically makes sense. Yep. Next question. Hi, could you please talk about possibility or if presumably if they should? use a product like Gorilla, Gorilla Mind Sigma, which has Tonkat Ali, Fidoja Agrestis, to potentially increase net androgens before and during intake of oral finasteride or dutasteride. Any dangerous or counteractions between these natural test boosters and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors? Interesting. Um, I know we've talked about a lot of the potential adverse effects and things to monitor um, for these supplements, but I don't think we've talked about the interaction between the two. Um, could you accompany that with the explanation of mechanism of action again, um, presumably of uh, the proposed mechanism of action of Fidoja agrestis and Tonkat Ali? And then, oh, and they asked, is it the increased LH that stimulates latex cells in the testes for Fidoja? Yes. Yeah, so you're going to see an increase in testosterone numbers just from the 5AR inhibitor alone. Um, the Tom Ali, we have more data in terms of what you could expect from that. And some people will be non-responders, um, but some people do get a very robust response to Tom Ali. Um, the mechanism there is basically upregulating certain enzymes for steroidogenesis. And this is primarily happening in the latex cells, some in the adrenal cells. Um, mm -hmm. You're gonna get a bit more of a net increase in DHEA production and also an increase in steroids that upstream lead to the testosterone downstream produced by the latex cells. Yep. On the Fidoja side, um, primarily we're thinking in simple terms, like you'll get more net LH signaling at the level of the latex cell, mm -hmm. perhaps an increase in serum LH as well. So mm -hmm. all of those pieces together, if you're looking for what are the possible side effects here, basically the side effects would be related to if you have too large of an increase in testosterone then you could, in theory, have the same effects as taking too much testosterone. Mm -hmm. Although it's less likely because usually you're not going to be capable of a, a natural production of something like 1,500 nanograms per deciliter. Um, and then you know, pair that with being on finasteride, dutasteride, a little bit more likely to have some nipple sensitivity, uh, mm -hmm. symptoms of high estrogen, those sorts of things. Yeah, uh, Tomcat does not appear to be a clinically significant aromatase inhibitor. Again, in human studies, estradiol levels tend to increase congruently with androgen levels. And um, SHBG can increase if it's extremely low, uh, presumably because of increased estrogen. And it does t tend to decrease if it's extremely high, uh, usually over 100. It's not unusual for Tomcat to help decrease that, uh, especially in females, possibly because of androgen levels. But one thing that we should note, and I know we've done podcasts on this several times before, so we won't belabor it, is the safest way to avoid genotoxicity is to let your testes atrophy and make sure that there's very low enzymatic activity that could be producing any sort of androgen or hormone because um, even just high natural endogenous levels could carry that risk. So I kind of say that um, you know, tongue in cheek because lots of things carry uh, genotoxic risk. And a lot of times that there's uh, studies from various parties that uh, are promoting other things in the testosterone booster world. There's a whole bunch of parties that are very financially involved. I believe we have, uh, I would say, essentially for all intents and purposes, zero significant financial involvement within um, promoting, um, whether it's a stingy nettle root extract, or whether it's bulbine, or whether it's Sustanchi, or whether it's Fidosia, or whether it's Tongkat, really zero skin in the game. We just see what works and we monitor for side effects for our patients that do take these things, just like we would for medications. Um, your bare bone stack is still selenium, boron, vitamin D, um, and zinc. Magnesium. Magnesium, yep. making sure you have those things either in the diet or via supplementation. 
Yeah. And someone please do study Fedoja because as of the time of recording, there are still zero studies published in humans on Fedoja. Yep. So specifically Fedoja agrestis, there's other species in the Fedoja genus, which have um, very concerning data, um, which are really not worth doing clinical studies, not really worth doing a human study. So that's the species that we're most interested in. All right. Now, Juicebox86 says, blood work in, fellows. After four months of less than 70 grams of carbs per day, I am finally back in range for my fasting blood glucose at 99 milligrams per deciliter. Currently, yeah, uh, top side of normal, but better than it was. AST, um, probably ALT, uh, back in range. BUN, BUN creatinine ratio are both still on the upper end. Not sure if this is creatinine supplementation, oyster protein. Probably. Um, also been increasing meat intake, so maybe that's that. Uh, I said, not sure what to do other than drink more water. I think we have a great answer for this as it relates to kidney function. Yep. Check us a stat and see. Um, that's going to give you a much more accurate marker of kidney function if you are increasing lean body mass or yep. resistance training. Um, the BUN could be elevated from increased protein intake. You have a series of conversions from you know, amino acids into ammonium, into urea, that will drive up your BUN sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then the creatinine increases as body mass, specifically lean body mass increase. Yep. So uh, we can't really say whether or not it's concerning just based on this limited information. But uh, if I if this is all I had to go off of, I would say you know, check us a stat C and yep. You know, congratulations on lowering the glucose. Yeah, this is great. Uh, maybe consider a CGM as well. Given that 99 is still a touch on the higher end, mm -hmm. um, maybe also look at a fasting insulin. Probably no reason to jump to an AMDA, SMDA, although a lot of uh, health optimization clinics would probably throw that on the panel. Just start a cystatin C first. You can also calculate an EGFR from your cystatin C and then bring that into your uh, primary doc or even your nephrologist, and uh, they will thank you for getting accurate EGFR, and you don't have to stop your creatinine, or your, sorry, your creatine. If you're taking creatinine, then maybe you can stop that. <laughs> yeah. Now we have someone saying, uh, in response to our anabolics video, presumably, mm -hmm. was wondering how I can get those 12 and a half inch guns, presumably in reference to our arm circumference, or maybe arm mm -hmm. diameter. 12 and a half inch guns. I was going to say, the only thing that I have that's 12 and a half inches is my calves. And I can give you some uh, tips on, on uh, getting those and all the exercises I do for that. Um, but yeah, I suppose the, what would the influencer answer be to that? See my, see my deadlift, see my bench. Are and here's my post our my stats. DEXA scan. Yeah, yeah let's uh, post my DEXA scan up. Cameron can put it on there. And then if you can beat that like lean body mass to body fat ratio or what? Actually, you did. Yeah, I think you put your DEXA up on Instagram Story, the other day. Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll post the, that up for an influencer answer. There you go. <laughs> yep. Little angry face. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have been on a finasteride for one year now and have halted my hair loss with slight regrowth. I have experienced no major side effects, but slightly less morning erections and slightly less libido. Would it be reasonable to switch from one milligram finasteride daily to 0.5 mg dutasteride once a week and see how they respond? I assume they mean 0.5 dutasteride. They actually don't specify the medication True. there. True. I added that part. Yeah. Um, it could it's it's got to be that. Could even be reasonable to switch to a quarter milligram of finasteride daily. You get about the same level of DHT suppression. But mm -hmm. if they're looking to continue this pattern of regrowth, probably a better chance with sort of dipping their toe in the water of the dutasteride side of things. Probably so. Uh, it is slightly tempting as with anything else. We'd ask where the lab's at and then where are those various markers. Progestogen pool, androgen pool, androgen to estrogen ratio, total estrogens, and then OCD, libido, um, anxiety tendencies. Yeah, yeah, and I think 0 0.5 milligrams every five days would be about on par with one milligram of finasteride, just based on the yep. data that's out there, but certainly would want to start a little bit slower and then titrate up as tolerated. Mm -hmm. Next question. Can you talk about proviron? I wonder, I wonder if this is like, 
Cameron or my brothers or someone asking these <laughs> asking these various questions about our guns and pro Byron. But thank you. We, we love talking about uh, any synthetic androgen. But yeah, um, commonly used in Europe, um, non-suppressive, right? And can be used to lower SHBG with no side effects. And it can and lower LP total, little a. It can lower total testosterone too. Oh, we're talking about advantages of or the upsides of proviron. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, used in European countries, not approved um, here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly yeah. can be suppressive at high enough doses. And if you're lowering your yep. SHBG, which it can lower SHBG very potently, yep. then you are also going to burn through your total testosterone very quickly, lowering your total testosterone, mm -hmm. even if you are not suppressed. This so, is, yeah, it's a synthetic androgen. Uh, DHT derivative. So the the dose makes the poison. Um, if there is clinical utility, and I don't think there's any studies, there's studies on its cousin oxandrolone on lipoprotein little a. But if there's clinical utility, that would probably be it. And extremely small doses. But yeah, uh, assuming that they're talking about oral proviron, um, any oral androgen going through first pass in the liver, um, the downside is almost for sure going to outweigh the upside. Yeah, and if I was sort of just picking a drug to run a trial on LPA outcomes, I would pick something less liver toxic. I would go with Pelicarcinone. Oh, that. Over, oh. yeah. <laughs> Pel unless Pelicarcin happens to have a side effect of increasing lean body mass. You never know. That's true. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do a lot more on LP little a in the future. It looks like that is the last question. I guess that's a wrap. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sending the questions. Keep sending more, and we'll keep doing Q&A podcast. Uh, but yeah, thank you for your time and stimulating the algorithm. And as always, may God bless you with health and happiness.